Okay, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and begin and just start as always in prayer and just kind of bring ourselves into the mystery of God who is eternally present to us and always calling to us and desiring to purify and enlighten and unite with us even more deeply. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to conform us each more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Increase your gifts of faith, hope, and charity within us, Lord, and enlighten our minds with a deeper understanding of your word and your message so that we can enliven our hearts with a greater love for you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So, where did we stop last time? I've got two classes, and you guys always are in different places. Wednesday's class was 24. Okay. Um, did we talk, did we, did we get into the three angels? I think we started them, didn't we? Okay. So... So what, what page, you guys? 24, 24 25? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah, so okay, then we're on the last part of chapter 14. I have the handouts for the next uh, four chapters tonight. So uh, chapter uh, 12, 13, and 14 are all, are all a super long interlude um, between the seven trumpet judgments and what will be the last set of seven uh, judgments, which are the seven chalices. And so in 12, 13, and 14, we're really introduced to sort of all the, the main players, so to speak, that will occur in the wars following uh, these chapters. So in chapter 12, we're introduced to the son of the woman, the woman, the dragon. Uh, in chapter 13, we're introduced to the two beasts. And then at the beginning of chapter 14, we looked at the army of the lamb, uh, gathered with him on Mount Zion, kind of as this image of victory right before um, the, the story of, of judgment then falls. And so the three angels that we looked at last week, there are these three angels in succession who fly over and have uh, messages for um, ever kind of uh, more specific messages. The first one cries out um, the eternal gospel, so it's the last chance for Israel especially the leadership, to accept the gospel, worship him because he's coming. The second one then is more national in its uh, proclamation. Fallen is Babylon the Great, and Babylon is Jerusalem. We're going to read about her a lot in chapters 17, uh, 18, 19. And then the third one finally is very specific on those individuals who follow the beast, etc. Um, you have eternal death and uh, the punishment of eternal death. And then the, that section ends with this promise of blessed are those the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the Spirit says, let them find rest from their labors for their works accompany them. And as we mentioned, the dead who die in the Lord from now on is because from this point, Jesus has opened up the gates of heaven. Uh, the dead enter into heaven. There's not just the place of the dead where good and bad went prior to this. Uh, but they're now in the presence of Christ. They're in the presence of the Lord. And so the last part of chapter 14 is also kind of a future in the sense that um, it, it's really looking at what's going to happen or it corresponds to the same things that are occurring in chapters 18 and 19. But what John sees is this. And the imagery, you'll, you're going to, it'll probably call to mind certain things from the Gospels, teachings of Jesus, statements he makes. But here's what it says. He says, Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud, one who looked like a son of man, with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out in a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap the harvest, for the time to reap has come, because the earth's harvest is fully ripe. So the one who was sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, who also had a sharp sickle. And then another angel came from the, who came from the altar, who was in charge of the fire, cried out in a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, 
Use your sharp sickle and cut the clusters from the earth's vines, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and cut the earth's vintage. He threw it onto the great winepress of God's fury. The winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood poured out of the winepress to the height of a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Okay, so we have this imagery of harvesting. And like I said, Jesus brings up these images a lot when he talks about um, his second coming, etc. Now, the first person who's introduced is I looked and I saw sitting on a cloud was one like the Son of Man. So that goes back to Daniel mm -hmm. and the whole imagery of the Son of Man, who's the human being who receives all the power, glory, and dominion from God. And of course, Jesus himself uh, referred to himself as that or admitted that that was him when questioned by the high priest, and that's the immediate cause of his crucifixion and death from the Jewish standpoint, for handing him over to death, is because this is Jesus. So here we see Jesus um, specifically performing a role here. And unlike the, the, the earlier statements of the Son of Man spoken of both by Jesus and in the book of Daniel, in this case he said don't be holding or wearing two things. He's got a crown and he has a sickle. So he has these two objects that aren't really spoken of in the earlier um, references to the, the Son of Man. He's also seated on the cloud. That's called the Shekinah. It's the glory cloud. It's God's presence. Uh, you see it over and over again throughout the uh, Old and New Testament. Wherever God is kind of present, because we can't really perceive God per se, but we can perceive his glory, his sort of manifestation in this world. And so, you know, uh, Moses entered the cloud of glory at the top of Mount Sinai, where he met God and got the Ten Commandments. Um, you have the, the glory cloud that followed Israel through the desert. Um, you have the glory cloud that uh, came down upon the tabernacle, later upon the temple to manifest in the ark. And then in the New Testament, it's all over the place as well. Christ ascends to heaven on the cloud of glory. The book of Hebrews talks about all the, um, the cloud of witnesses being the saints who inhabit this cloud of glory. So it's, it's a common image. And specifically, it's spoken of, of Daniel in, uh, or of the Son of Man figure in both Daniel and Jesus. He says, you'll see the Son of Man coming in glory on the clouds. So all that points to the fact that this is Jesus who's being spoken of here and now. Um, what's interesting, though, is now its color is white. Every time it appeared in the Old Testament, it's been dark. And so there's this image of victory, of purity, of something that's different in God's sort of interaction with the human race at this point. Um, now, he tells us he wears a gold crown on his head and held a sharp sickle in his hand. Again, the word for crown here is the one that actually means one that's worn by a ruler or a king, diadema, as opposed to stephanos, which is the crown of a person who's victorious in combat or in sports. Um, so it signifies his, his kingship. And then it also signifies his judgment aspect, which we're going to see in a moment when we look a little more at what happened here. So you see the Son of Man, you see Jesus in glory on the cloud, holding this ob these objects or wearing them. And then another angel comes out of the temple, the temple always meaning the heavenly temple in this case. And he cries out in a loud voice to Jesus, the Son of Man. Um, it's not as weird as it sounds, right? Because it, the angel is carrying out the command of God the Father to tell the Son when it's time to perform his ministry. So he says, Use your sickle and reap the harvest, for the time to reap has come, because the earth's harvest is fully ripe. Um, so what we see is the first angel in this, there's two triads of angels. We had three just before in verses 6 to 13, and now we have three more with Jesus in the middle of them. It's called a triptych. You have God in the middle, or Jesus, 
and he's surrounded by three angels on one side and three angels on the other. So the first three come down proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the fall of Babylon, proclaiming eternal death for those who follow the beast. Then Jesus appears, and now we're having these other angels. One proclaims what the, um, he's to do. Another one will come out um, and have his own sickle. And then the third one will come out from the fire of the altar and proclaim. So you have this image of Jesus, literary-wise, surrounded by all these angels. It's like the angels work up to a point, then Jesus appears, and then the angels continue to do their work um, that he brings them to. Now, all of this like I said, is very familiar to the gospel stories and parables. So, for example, on the next to the last paragraph on page 26, you have Jesus talking about when he comes again. And here he says, quote, the sign of the Son of Man, so then you have the Son of Man imagery, will appear in the heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a trumpet blast, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So we have the image of God of Jesus coming both in judgment and in salvation, right? Depending on which side you fall on, vis-a-vis -vis him when he comes. But in addition, we also have these parables where he talks about, or statements where he talks about the kingdom as the great harvest. Uh, so for example, at the bottom page 26, it says, this is how it is with the kingdom of God. It's as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would grow and sprout. He knows not how. Of its own accord, the land yields fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wields his sickle at once, for the harvest has come. And then later, he's even more specific about it, because that was more of a general story of just growth of the kingdom. But a little bit later on in his ministry, he's very specific, and this one actually comes from John, his gospel, so it's very connected to the book of Revelation. And in speaking to the apostles, he says this, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say in four months the harvest will be here? I tell you, look up and see the fields ripe for the harvest. The reaper is already receiving his payment and gathering crops for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For here the saying is verified that one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you had not worked for. Others have done the work and you are sharing in the fruits of their work. So all this background, all this imagery is a story about Jesus coming to save those who belong to him and to sit in judgment on those who oppose him. And so at that point, sort of realizing the imagery and who Jesus is, then we have this angel that comes out and calls forth to him to go ahead and reap the earth. And so... Um, Throwing his sickle over the earth, we're told. You know, this image, he says, So the one who was sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the whole earth is harvested. So he's sending out the harvesters, he's reaping the land, etc. Now what's interesting is the image of the sickle throughout the Old and New Testament is connected with the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, it's one of the images of the feast in Judaism even before Christianity adopts that feast because Pentecost is the, the, the final ingathering of the fruit when the grain had been harvested. It also commem commemorates the giving of the Torah to Israel on Mount Sinai. So it has both a historical connection to the Jews receiving the Torah, the covenant, and it also had this agricultural reality in that it took part or took place right at the time of the great harvest. And so it's not accidental that Pentecost is the feast chosen by God upon which to release the Holy Spirit upon the church. We're kind of the, quote, first fruits. You see that language again and again of the great harvest that's coming. So Jesus reaps the earth. And then we see another angel who comes out of the temple in heaven, and he also has this sickle. And just like what happened with Jesus himself, yet a third angel, another angel, comes out from the altar who was in charge of the fire. 
So here we have this, the third and final angel of this second triad of angels. There's two things about him that are important. First of all, he comes from the altar in heaven, and he's the angel of fire, in charge of the fire, or literally the angel of fire. The fact that he comes from the altar, if you remember way back in chapters 5 and 6, when John first sees the heavenly altar, underneath the altar is the martyrs. Mm -hmm. And if you remember at that time, they cry out, how long, O Lord, when are you going to act, etc. So the fact he's coming from the altar means that God is finally answering the martyr's plea. He's acting now to do what needs to be done. Um, fire is also connected to the altar. In the Jerusalem temple, there were two altars. There's the bronze altar outside in the courtyard, which you actually perform the sacrifices on of both animals and produce. Inside the tabernacle was the small gold altar, a very small one, and that was used only for incense and to put tiny um, marks of blood on the four corners of it. So in heaven, it seems as if there's this one altar that kind of combines both. It both has the fire, it has the, the altar itself where sacrifice is made, is imaged by the martyrs being under it, the, where the blood coagulates, so to speak. The fire, um, when Isaiah saw the heavenly altar, one of the cherubim took a coal from the fire in the altar and touched his mouth, and that's how he became a prophet. So you have this imagery of, of, of the fire. It's also interesting that throughout the book of Revelation, we've seen all these angels that are connected to um, uh, elements and such. And so we've seen that the four living creatures are angels who are connected to the zodiac signs, one at each of the four points of the compass of the zodiac. And then we have all these elements. We're going to very be, soon be introduced to the angel of water, who is actually Raphael. Um, he's the healing angel, and if you remember the story, he's the angel of healing. If you remember the story of Jesus, the angel of the stirs up the waters to heals people at the pool, but the guy can't get into it in time, and so he makes his appearance in a little bit. But here we have the angel of fire, and so fire is, uh, like many of the images of God, is kind of this dual nature. It's both one of you know power. The Holy Spirit is fire, and um, that imagery. It's also the same color as blood. And even in our vestments today, the vestments of the priests have the same nature. So on the feast day of a martyr, he wears red for blood. And then on days like Pentecost and such, he wears the same red, but now for the Holy Spirit. So it has this, this dual connection of the two. So this angel coming forth from the altar, sort of carrying the very fire of the altar, and the martyr's plea with him now commands the um, other angel that has the sickle to make his harvest as well. Now, where Jesus' harvest was of presumably like grain or wheat or something, the second one is, has a vintage. He has to cut grapes. Mm -hmm. So the first imagery is a positive one. Jesus comes, and those he harvests are his. He's brought the saved in. The second image of the harvest is one of judgment. The grapes actually represent God's judgment, because what, is, what is, happens as soon as he gets the grapes, he cuts the clusters, and then what does he do? He throws them into the wine press of God's fury. So the grapes here represent evil and judgment on the evil. The wheat or the grain or whatever represents the harvest of the good. So we see here both groups being... Um, uh, coming into their their judgment, the scrutiny of the Lord. So we've heard that the God from the throne has finally answered the martyr's prayer. The earth is being harvested. The land is being reaped. They're being brought into the kingdom. And now we see this other one who is um, now doing this, this, a similar action. He's harvesting, but in his case, it has to do with judgment and such. So we're also told something about what's going to happen with it. It says the wine press, because he throws it in the wine press, the wine press was trodden outside the city 
and blood poured out of the wine press to the height of a horse's bridle 200 miles. Mm. Kind of gruesome, right? So <laughs> let's see what's going on here. Uh, on page 28, the first thing to realize is, and we, we've seen this throughout, and you've, it's actually been in a few of the gospel readings over the past few weeks. Um, the vineyard always represents Israel, right? Mm -hmm. We had three parables in a row that dealt with the vineyard. You have two right. sons that he has to work in the vineyard. You have the hired workers every three hours. He gets to work in the vineyard. And I forget what the third one is, but it's a vineyard one as well. So for three weeks in the liturgy, just a, I think the last one was just a couple of weeks ago, we've the heard, watchtower. yeah, the watchtower. Uh, we've had this vineyard images, and it's always Israel. So it's the same here. We're talking here not about the judgment of the earth per se. That comes later. We're going to see in chapter 20. But this is the judgment of, of the false, quote unquote, false Israelites who have been not been true to the covenant by rejecting their Messiah. So Israel is, is introduced by this. Uh, by the vineyard and the parable that was just mentioned the parable of the tenants has to do with the vineyard and it's one of the last parables that Jesus speaks before his death um, if you go if you have your your Bibles go to Matthew and I think it's chapter uh, 21 if I'm not mistaken in Matthew chapter 21 we have where it occurs. Um, yeah. Yes, for verse 33. Um, now, if you go back just a minute, just to kind of look for a moment, though, you'll notice that chapter 20, the first 16 verses of that are the workers in the vineyard. So we have a vineyard image of Jesus. Then he predicts his passion. Then he enters Jerusalem. So now he has finally entered Jerusalem. So this is the last teachings of Jesus' life before his death and resurrection. And it's not, it's interesting what he does immediately because you can see it heading to a climax. The first thing he does as soon as he gets in the city is he cleanses, he cleanses the temple. Mm -hmm. It's verses 12 through 17. Then he curses the fig tree, another image of Israel. So he goes from cleansing the temple because it's been profaned to cursing Israel. Then we have a little interlude where his authority is questioned. Um, and then he gives these parables. One is the parable of the two sons I mentioned. And notice verse 28, go out and work in the vineyard. So you have the two sons, each of which is representative of a response to Jesus or to God through Jesus um, to do their part, to bear their fruit. And one of the sons says yes, and one of the sons says no. And so in, in the original meaning of the parable, there weren't any Gentiles even involved. We're talking about the Jewish response. Some say yes, some say no. And so those who say no, even though they, so what it is is, the one says yes, but doesn't go, right? They just do it superficially to look good. The other one says no, and then feels bad and goes. And so he talks about it's the second one who actually inherits what the Lord, ha what God the Father has to offer him. That's the true son. The one who said yes, but doesn't actually live the faith, they're lost. Now again, this originally was just in the context of Israel. So everything is heading towards the culmination of Jesus' last warnings to his people before judgment falls. And it's at that point we get to the parable of the tenants. And the imagery, all the, all the imagery of the vineyard, the hedge, the wine press, the tower, that all goes back to a parable in um, Isaiah the prophet. I'm not, we're not going to go back and look at it. But the point being, as soon as Jesus starts discussing this parable everyone would know what he's talking about. Hmm. Now, the, in the original parable of, of um, Isaiah, it wasn't the tenants, it was the grapes themselves. God made this vineyard, and when the time came for the grapes to give their wine, he found out that they weren't good grapes, they were wild grapes, wild grapes. poisonous grapes. So in that case, like we see in Revelation, the grapes themselves represent the people. Now here Jesus makes it a little more explicit, right? You can't miss what he's talking about. So he tells the story. He says, 
Um, this man came, he planted a vineyard, he put the hedge, he did all these things. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce, but they seized the servants. One they beat, another they killed, a third they stoned. So again, he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire the inheritance. They seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, keep that in mind. They threw him out of the vineyard because when you go back and look at Revelation of the part we're looking at, um, what it says is he threw it, uh, the wine press was trodden outside of the city. So keep this in mind because this is all interconnected. So they cast him outside of the vineyard. They killed him. Then Jesus, like he likes to do, he tells a story and then he asks the people, to sort of judge themselves because they don't know it's about them per se, or at least not everybody. Some do as we're going to see. He says, so what do you think the owner will do when he finally comes? Right? They've killed his own son, all of his messengers. What's he going to do when he finally returns? They answered, he will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the correct times. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The one who falls on this stone will be dashed to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. So he tells his parable. Then we're told, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. And although they were attempting to arrest him, they feared the crowds, for they regarded him as a prophet. And then what we also see is there's a third parable, which we'll just briefly mention, which doesn't have to do with wheat and harvesting, but you get the same image. Here we have the great wedding feast, right? Um, in fact, this was Sunday's gospel. Mm -hmm. So... Again, you have the imagery of, it's the same story in each one. Israel has failed, so the Jews who people thought were as the dregs of society, the prostitutes, tax collectors, the poor, the peasants, they're going to be the people who inherit the kingdom, not the scribes, the priests, the Pharisees, etc., the elites. Now, as, as the church grows, that changes, you know, in Gentile context and stuff, but that's all the original story. And here we have the same story again, but in a different imagery. But this time the kingdom is likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So notice there's always the son, there's always the king or the landowner. Um, and so we have the wedding feast. So this is the kingdom, right? That's the end of Revelation ends with the great wedding feast of the lamb, of which the Eucharist is a foretaste and pointer towards. And so notice he sends his servants to the invited guest but they don't come. And so he sends a second group out, and they don't come. In fact, they give excuses, right? Some ignored it and went away, one to his farm, another his business, so they all are too busy with, quote, life. Others laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And then it, the story takes a weird turn, which clearly would have thrown the people off, because it doesn't necessarily fit in the story really well at this point. But it's a dire warning of what's coming. He says, the king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murders, and burned their city, mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Right? Then finally, he sends them out, and he says, basically, go out and take whoever. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. go out and call everybody. So they do, but then you have the, the interesting part at the end that when um, he comes in, there's a man there not dressed in the wedding garment, uh, and so he casts him outside with the, the other great sinners, the wicked. Uh, and then the last um, kind of scary threat or statement, many are invited, but few are chosen. Right? Very different from our idea, where we think everybody's chosen and just a few have to try so hard not to make it that they're a tiny minority. It's never what the Bible says. It's always the other direction. Right? The road is broad and most take it. 
The one that's narrow is very hard and very few find it. Lord, will many be saved? He doesn't answer the question. He just says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Um, but here we have a similar one. Many are invited, but few are actually chosen. And so what we see in all these parables, though, is, the, is really the same story over and over. The invited guests, the tenants, the good son have failed to live up to what they were supposed to do. And so after sort of answering a few questions, then the rest of the Bible, uh, of, of, until the crucifixion, one whole chapter, chapter 23 of Matthew, is in sevenfold curse on the Pharisees and scribes from Jesus. So now he curses the group. Then at the end of chapter 23, he weeps over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how many times I yearn to gather your children together as a hen gathers her young under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house will be abandoned, desolate, the house being the temple. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we have chapter 24, which is the whole story of the fall of the, of the temple, the last days, the destruction of Israel, the coming of the Son of Man, uh, all the... Um, exhortations to be prepared because you don't know what day it's going to happen uh, be faithful to the end and then he gives a few more parables that tell about what we're what they're supposed to be doing and only then he ends with a judgment on the nations and then the rest of the story is his crucifixion mm -hmm. and resurrection so you'll notice all the last things Jesus is doing if you never noticed it before then look at any of the gospels Mark yeah. Luke it's the same pattern Jesus' whole last week is spent doing only one thing, and that is calling Israel to repentance in its last chance before they kill their own Messiah. So now, coming back to the, in Revelation, we have uh, this same basic imagery. We have the grapes that represent Israel, at least fallen Israel. The wheat represented good Israel. And that grapes are going to be made into the wine of God's fury. It was trodden outside the city because Jesus was executed outside of the city of Jerusalem on, on uh, Calvary. Mount Calvary. So we have this um, imagery of everything that's happening is sort of bringing us to this final um, conclusion. In this last section, the state of Israel, or the country of, I should say, the land of Israel, the earth, as it's translated in my translation, occurs six times, right? A symbol of falling short. <coughs> and then when you mix that with the vineyard imagery and all the other things, it's clear that um, what's happening is the, the judgment on Israel has finally come. This is literally how the Gospels started, Right? With the exception of Matthew and, and Luke that have the short stories about Jesus' infancy and death, from the very first moment of preaching with John the Baptist, what do we have? We have the condemnation of Israel. Right? What does John say? How dare you come to be baptized? You have to do good fruits and produce good fruits if you want to be saved. And don't say because you're Jewish that matters because God doesn't care. He could make Jews from the very stones. Right? So from the very beginning of even the forerunner's ministry, this has been the last condemnation, the last telling Israel that they've got it wrong for a long time, and the time has now come for them to um, come about. Now, although John doesn't mention it here, he probably, and most scholars think, in early church fathers too, there's all this imagery of the vineyard, and then we're going to see in chapter 15 very soon, we're going to have wine, or chalices, which normally would be filled with wine, which are blood. So you have Eucharistic imagery. You have, and, and all this ties in sort of with Jesus, who replaces Israel, right? Jesus now is the true vine, and we have no life apart from him. We're the branches of the true vine. So in a sense, Jesus has replaced uh, old Israel to become the new, re renewed Israel that both Jew and Gentile um, are connected to. So what all of these things are pointing to, with the vintage story, with the harvest, all these things we, look, we briefly looked at in, the, in his parables as we're heading towards judgment, the judgment on the temple, the judgment on the fig tree, 
all of it is the same thing. Israel is not producing fruit. And that's the problem. And so on page 29, we have one of his declarations that at the point when he first spoke it, it hadn't become entirely clear who was being referred to. It becomes more clear as the ministry progresses. But it's just as true for us as well. He says, quote, either declare the tree good and its fruit is good, or declare the tree rotten and its fruit is rotten. For a tree is known by its fruit. And then notice what he says. You brood of vipers, you children of the snake, right? You're the dragon's children. How can you say good things when you are evil? For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good person brings forth good out of a store of goodness, but an evil person brings forth evil out of a store of evil. That's kind of his main topic, and he, he repeats that in different ways elsewhere. This particular time, he's speaking about our language. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will render an account for every careless word they speak. By your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. I always point this one out to my daughters. It's a fun one, right? <laughs> like, careful, every single word you speak, right? And I don't know if it works, but <laughs> not entirely, because they're still really mean to each other and us, but that's okay. So um, the thing that's important, too, is whatever Christ asks of us, he does himself. Right? He's our model because he does himself what he asks for us to do. Right? And if we're made the image and likeness of God, which is literally the image of the Son, then we need to be like that. That's the fruit God is looking for. Mm. And so we need to be like Jesus, healing, feeding, you know, praying for people, all the different things we see him doing to the extent it, that our vocation connects with that um, and our place in life. We need to do the same thing. So throughout this whole thing, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, from the very first words he speaks to his last words prior to being uh, killed on the cross, Jesus has proclaimed that God has finally returned in him and that Israel now has to respond to the summons. God has called them that this is the time you've been waiting for, right? Quote, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If they hide their light, if they lose their saltiness, then they're, quote, no longer good for anything but to be thrown down and trampled underfoot. The same language he'll use when Jerusalem is destroyed by the Gentiles. You'll be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until their time has ended. Instead, he has called Israel back and through Israel the rest of the world, but he first has to get Israel to recall and begin its true vocation. That is to live the Torah perfectly, right? He, the Torah is now to be extended to the furthest reaches of charity so that one becomes like God himself, quote, perfect. So you must be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. So it's no longer just I can feel like I'm a holy person because I obey the letter of the law because charity has no end. I can always be more loving, more of service, more charitable. So I'm constantly being asked to expand myself more and in places out of my comfort zone, right? To those who I'm not used to being with, maybe it's the poor, you know, a lot of people are afraid to work with the poor because they just don't know what it'll be like and they're kind of scared. It extends ultimately even to enemies. So in other words, we are called upon to be like God himself, and that's what Jesus is telling Israel, and now us as the church, what we're supposed to do. And to be perfect requires that we live out those deeds of charity and service to others in concrete, practical ways, to imitate Christ. It's not by accident that Luke has the same teaching, but because he's writing to almost entirely Gentile Christians who will not understand the Jewish language of perfection, and many of us don't, he changes the word. So be, anyone recall what it is? Merciful. So be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. That's, that's Luke's change. He looks at it, he, looks, he knows what Jesus said, and he goes, no Gentile's gonna understand that. 
So it means to be merciful because God is merciful. That's at least in his actions towards us, that is his most prominent trait. In a sense, he has to be. I mean, it's kind of sad. We're such screw-ups that the only way we experience his love primarily is by having him to always constantly pardon us. But that's simply the reality. And so we are now called upon to be like him. And so what we've been seeing, you know, through Revelation and, and the statements, you know, their works accompany them, uh, all these, uh, those who they keep God's commandments and their faith in Christ. What we really see is that those who put Jesus' words into practice don't, really, don't merely assent to them mentally and say, yes, I believe that. That's sort of the criteria, ultimately, of salvation. This is the response of faith for which is God is looking for. And the sad part of the story is when he comes to his own people, the vast majority of them at that time period don't accept that. And so judgment falls. Now Israel still was Israel still fulfilled its mission because it brought forth the Messiah and the original core of our church is 100% Jewish, right? All 12 apostles, Mary, Jesus himself, all the first initial converts. So and Paul talks about that, you know, that the root, the 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 source is still Israel who has been saved. But in terms of that time in history, and this is one thing we have to keep keeping in mind, it's that time in history, that generation living in that moment in time of Israel, not every Jewish generation ever since. As soon as judgment fell on Jerusalem, the judgment of Israel is over. So no Jew today or in the thousands of years since, thousand years since, can be in any way connected to that, that you know, curse or that fall or that sinfulness. Um, we'll talk about how God deals with them when we get a little closer to the end of the, the book of Revelation. So that's what the whole story is. Jesus sends the apostles out with that proclamation. Um, unfortunately, his message causes as much resistance and hatred as much, as much as those who respond and accept it because many in Israel refuse to hear the divine summons. And I use that word because uh, before his death, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, while he was still Pope, wrote a three-volume set on Jesus called Jesus of Nazareth. And they're great books. The first one is Jesus' Ministry and Life. The second one is very small. It's about the Christmas, basically the Christmas stories, his birth, a very thin one. And then the last one is just about um, his uh, passion, death, and resurrection. So he wrote them not as a pope in the sense that he didn't claim that they were infallible documents or anything like that, but he wrote them as a, as a Christian who had studied Jesus for a long time. And of course, the fact that he was pope still gives it some you know, weight, even more than he already had as one of the greatest theologians in our time. And he has a whole chapter on the idea of the call. And he says the term call is so meager that we don't catch it. Jesus isn't calling us. God is summoning us through Jesus. And when God summons you, you better respond or else there's consequences. And that's clearly what Jesus' message is. It's not just a, hey, do what you want. Obviously, he lets people do what they want. Those who respond, he accepts. Those who don't, he doesn't you know, continually chase after them. He lets them do what they desire. But make no mistake, it's not a call, like, you know, it's a summons. The creator himself is summoning people to answer, to respond to what he's saying to them. That he's coming again, the kingdom is here, and it's time to enter in and start living as if it were already present. And so we see this, um, this struggle going on, and this also helps explain some of Jesus' more difficult statements. Uh, for example, don't think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I haven't come to bring peace but the sword. He says, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's enemies will be those of his own household. Right? That explains exactly what Jesus does in the division within Israel against him. Some in the same family will accept him. Others will not. And later, the ones who do not 
will have their own relatives put to death, he tells us often. So it, it becomes this, Jesus becomes this sort of dividing force within Israel as they're struggling to how they respond to the summons. Is this really God? Is this really the Messiah? Or is this just some kind of charlatan? And that's why he tells the apostles that when they go to a town, not only do they announce the gospel of peace, but if the town doesn't accept it, what do they do? They curse them. Right? He says, quote, as you enter a house, wish it peace. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. This image that Jesus has kind of bestowed his peace on the apostles, and as they go places, that peace is extended to the people who accept the message. <clears throat> if not, if it's not a worthy house, let your peace return to you. And whoever will re not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that town and shake the dust from your feet. For on men I say to you, it will be more tolerable from the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than on that town. Again, referring to what's going to happen in the Jewish war to a lot of these places. And, but he warns his people as well, those who do follow him, those who reject the gospel aren't just okay with rejecting it. They are going to persecute the messengers just as they are persecuting the messenger, Christ himself. So at the end of page 30, he says, Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of people, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be led before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them and the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. For it will not be you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death. Father, his child, children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But whoever endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen, I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man mm -hmm. comes. No disciple is above his teacher, no slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher for the slave that he become like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, if they've called me Satan, that's what they're going to call you. Right? How much more those of his household. Therefore, do not be afraid of them. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed. Nothing is sec nor secret that will not be known. What I say to you in darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Um, I'll jump down to the last part. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. So he explains quite clear the stakes to that first generation. And really, to some extent, all of us, although... At least in the United States, death and martyrdom hasn't been a case. Um, but it is interesting, having taught RCIA for 27 years now. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> um, you do, it is interesting how people's, different people's families react, right? You'll have a family that has a tradition of being Anglican. But this person will come because they didn't really grow up with any faith because their parents' faith consists of maybe going to church twice a year or something. But it's really interesting, the moment they start to make that move for Catholicism, not everyone by any means, but you, enough, at least one or two every year, the reaction of friends and family is, what are you doing, right? <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you becoming Catholic? We're Anglican and this and that and stuff. So, I mean, we, we have it. We don't have it to the extent that he's talking about here, but there is that reaction at times as people begin to move forward. Um, sadly, even among Catholics, you see that, right? Um, you have the Catholics who are very comfortable with just being once a week mass goers, and that's all I want. Right? <laughs> that's, that's good. And then their spouse or their kids or their sibling or close friend begins to get more interested, right? They start going to like Bible studies like this or things. And people tell me, you know, their, their friends will react like it's crazy. You're one night a week extra. And they'll be like, what are you, a fanatic now? Right? Why are you always at church? And you're like, 
one hour a week other than math, but that's just where they are, right? For them, they don't understand it because as far as they're concerned, they kind of have their own thing of what they think the faith requires or needs. So, I mean, that struggle is, is part of our experience, right? So we know it, but here Jesus is talking in historical terms that in that first generation, uh, within Israel itself, it really caused a huge divide um, who he was for those who accepted him and those who did not, even to the point of family members sort of handing them over to the Sanhedrin and people like Paul, uh, etc. And yet he mentioned, yeah, Saul, <laughs> he wasn't Paul yet, although he mentions, you know, despite all that, he says, don't be afraid of them. And then he says, um, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, all these human beings. As bad as it is, the worst they can do is kill you. That might seem terrible, but if you have faith, the point is that's not the end of everything. He says, don't be afraid of them, but be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. That's God. Some people think it's the devil. It's not the devil. God, devil can't destroy anyone's soul. He's suffering in Gehenna along with us, those sinners. That's God. So Jesus is ultimately saying, don't betray God. <laughs> right? Don't, don't step back at the end. Don't not uh, follow me because of the, the strife it's going to cause, the even possibility of death you're going to cause, because death is just the beginning for you. Right? Death is actually just the beginning for everyone, but you don't want to be on the side of your beginning as an eternal death, whereas opposed to this life um, empowered. So Jesus, everything he's been doing has been kind of uh, leading to this moment. And so now John is looking at this same storyline, but now seeing the sort of last act, so to speak, of the story uh, from his vision in heaven. And so what's what he's speaking about is really at this time, historically, we're looking at about the, the years 67 to 70 AD. The Roman legions of Vespasian have invaded uh, the Holy Land. They've taken the land of Judea and Galilee. They're killing large percentages of the population, driving others um, towards destruction. So all this symbolism is clear. Jerusalem is the vine that's harvested in blood and thrown on now a fire of destruction. So we have all this imagery of fire and, and blood and such. And Jesus himself prophesied when his last uh, homily in the temple. And here's what Jesus said right in the middle of page 32. When you see the desolating abomination spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, that the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A person on a housetop must not go down to get things of his house, out of his house. A person in the field must not return to get his cloak. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or in the Sabbath. For at that time there will be a great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And if those days had not been shortened, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, they will be shortened. Now that's how Matthew and Mark state it. And theirs historically is probably what Jesus actually said. But again, Luke is nice because Luke is writing to Gentiles who have no idea what the desolating abomination. They don't know the Jewish code language that's written in the first one. Um, and so they tell us more directly, what is Jesus talking about? So go down to the next indented one. And this is Luke's exact same repeat of what Matthew and Mark do, but in his own simple language. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know its desolation is at hand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains, let those within the city escape from it, and those in the countryside not enter. Right. In other words, in some sense, you're doing exactly what would be the common idea of that time. You would flee to the Jerusalem, which has the walls, which you could find protection. But he tells them, no, if you're in the, if you're in the country, flee to the mountains. If you're in the city, leave it. And if you're not in the city, do not enter the city, even though that might be the normal course that a person would take under invasion. Why? For these days are the time of punishment when all the scriptures are fulfilled. 
Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days, for a terrible calamity will come upon the earth and a wrathful judgment upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken as captives to all the Gentiles, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so that was spoken roughly 30 AD. We're now 40 years later, a whole generation, a time of testing after Jesus' ascension, and Jerusalem is going to fall to the Romans who will burn the city, who will destroy the temple. And for the most part, really ending the old covenant because it ends the sacrifices even to this very day. And so um, that's where we're brought to. Now, he's, he tells us this strange uh, piece of information. He says, the blood poured out of the wine press was a height of a horse's bridle for 16, he, he actually says 1600 status. It's a, it's a, yeah, a, a unit of measurement from back then. Um, what that means is 1600 status, the original number, not the 200 miles or whatever it gives us in the translation. This is where you kind of need a study Bible to help you better because th that translation doesn't help us understand what's being said. 1600, which would be um, the land of Israel squared times 10 squared, the largeness. The measurement of 1600 is just slightly, slightly larger than the whole country of Palestine. So the imagery is that the whole nation is going to be judged and covered in this blood. Right? It, it's, going to, it's going to fall on the whole place of Israel. And it's described in terms like a flood uh, that destroyed the, the first world. Um, you know, you get this image of a Red Sea because of the image of the horse's bridles. When the Red Sea were told what it looks like, they measured it by horse's bridles. So there's some Red Sea connection. So where once Israel was saved by passing through the Red Sea, now they're going to be drowned in their own Red Sea of blood and violence. And so John has this very specific thing for which he's, um, he's talking about. And as he talks about, he says it occurred outside the city because that's where Jesus was, um, was crucified. And so outside the city is always understood as the place of judgment. That's where the sacrificed animals that could not be eaten for whatever reason were disposed of. Um, now it's become the place of judgment because Christ's blood has been shed there. And so in this imagery, what John has this layer upon layer, he's basically telling us that the blood that flows outside the city belongs to Christ, sacrificed outside, and now it goes to cover all of apostate Israel. So those who accept Christ are going to be saved by drinking the blood of Christ, his wine. And those who don't are going to be drowned in the same quote-unquote blood. So blood is going to flow one way or the other, John tells us. If not the blood of Christ on your behalf, then it will be your blood that flows. And so in 70 AD, the vine of Israel is finally cut down. It's trampled in the wine press of God's fury. And this will be the final culmination of this process that began 40 years ago mm -hmm. when the Messiah was first crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. So um, that brings us to the end of 14. We just hit our break, but any, any questions before we move on? I know it's brutal, right? Yep. It's a brutal book. It's not like... <laughs> It'd be like Gaza. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was this, did John write this and the Jewish people, were Jewish people able to read this and possibly get a message from it and turn their ways? Or uh, was it's, it no, he wrote it for the church, but the church itself and their evangelization of Israel would have known the background. They would have already known it from Jesus. John is simply describing now in concrete detail what Jesus has already alluded to. So uh, Israel, or the church had never stopped evangelizing Israel, even though in the book of Acts, because of the way Luke writes it, the first half is basically the evangelization of Israel, and then the second half roughly is the evangelization of the Gentiles. 
But in reality, even while the Gentiles were being evangelized and growing little by little, uh, Israel was still being evangelized by people like James and many of the original apostles and their successors in the Holy Land and throughout. Um, all the Jews like Paul who lived outside of the, the uh, Holy Land but were part of Roman citizens and Greco-Roman world. So they never stopped evangelizing the Jews really until this point. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of in this whole period of time that we see things coming to a head that uh, in Jesus' own lifetime, we only see little snippets of it, but by the time we get to the book of Acts, we see it in more detail. So, for example, in John's gospel, we have the story of the man born blind that we re hear almost every year because of Lent. Um, and remember, he's kicked out of the synagogue because ultimately he believes in Jesus. Now, that's really the only exception we have at that or uh, incident we have of that in the lifetime of Christ himself. But then already in the book of Acts, and what John refers to here, and Jesus alludes to it, is, you know, you're going to be brought before the synagogues, you're going to be... So the, the, the breakup between ethnic Israel and the new Israel of the church, which was still predominantly Gen, uh, Jewish but becoming more and more Gentile, uh, it, it, it kind of went through a long period of, of break as well. Um, and it really won't reach its final break until almost 100 AD. So about 30 more years after the fall of Jerusalem, there's actually one last abortive attempt by Israel to overtake Rome. And that's called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Bar Kokhba means the, sun, the, the star in the sky. And that comes from the story of um, uh, uh, the story of Jacob and, and the star. He, you know, I see the remember Balaam. He says, "I see his star, not yet, but far away." And way back in the Torah, he's talking about this coming star. Well, it's Jesus, at least as we believe. But those Jews who didn't believe in Jesus, thirty years later, they proclaim this guy, whose real name I forget, but he's known as Bar Kokhba. Uh, the son of the star, he begins this last rebellion against Rome. And the last Jews of the Holy Land at that point are just decimated. Bar Kokhba is, is captured alive. He and the, the rabbis who back him, they're all killed. The Jews are pretty much driven out of the Holy Land entirely. And at that point, having lost the temple already, now having lost what was their last opportunity they see, um, the only group, the only surviving group of Israel left that has authority are the Pharisees. Right? The Sadducees go up in flames with the priesthood. Um, the Essenes are wiped out by the Romans, the, the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why, they have, that's why we have their scrolls, because they hid them knowing they were going to be wiped out. Uh, these zealots meet their end at Masada in their last holdout. So all these groups are gone. And the only group of, of Jewish authority, religious authorities left of any substantial size are the rabbis. And that's why Judaism, which is the religion of Israel after the fall of the temple, there was no such thing as Judaism in the time of Jesus in the early church, it's a later reality, um, is rabbinic. That is, it follows the law of the scribes and the rabbis. Um, and at that point, Israel definitively distances itself from Christianity. Uh, in fact, depending on the synagogue you go to to this day, um, if it's an Orthodox one or a Hasidic one, uh, there, there's something called the 13 benedictions, and you pray these things every morning and evening. If you can pray them at synagogue in the morning, great. If not, you do them as part of your prayers at home. But one of the prayers is, thank God, you thank God that you are not one of the heretic Christians, right? So at that point, any connection between Judaism and, and the church is lost because even those Jews who were still faithful to their old ancestral religion but were also Christian, you're basically at that point cannot, you can't be part of the synagogue because you can't sit there in good conscience and you, even while it's being pronounced around you, even if you don't say the curse, you, everyone around you is saying it and you realize you're in a place that you're no longer welcome. And so really at that point, there's a, a def definitive end between um, Israel and, and Christianity. And so it, it takes a while, but we see it beginning right from the time of 
the proclamation of the, of the apostles that Jesus is raised from the dead and therefore the Messiah, and finally ending in 100 AD. Uh, and it's roughly around that same time that Jews decide on their canon, where they'd never decided which books of the Bible are, quote, really scripture, except for the Torah. All Jews believe the Torah is scripture. But there had been no authoritative group who could make that decision before because the prophets had ceased prophesizing. You only have John the Baptist. Um, the kingship has, had ended, and the priesthood was kind of seen as corrupt, even though they were still priests. So there was no authority who could determine, quote unquote, what was the Jewish Bible. So the Jewish rabbis decide upon it. And they, they, one of the things to keep themselves as tac, intact as well is they rejected any book that they believed was not originally written in the sacred language of Hebrew. And so the seven books we call the, quote, deuterocanonicals, um, Baruch, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, uh, Book of Wisdom, Book of Sirach, um, uh, Tobit, and Judith. Those seven books are taken out of the, of the Jewish scriptures. And they determine what is today used by Protestants. Those books are, quote unquote, their Bible. Um, two things about it, though. What Protestants label as 39 books, Jews label as only 22. That's because... <laughs> Uh, all the books that we say one and two are one book in Hebrew. Mm. Uh, and then the big one is you have three major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and um, Jeremiah. And then there's the 12. And the 12 are one book. Mm. So those 12 prophets are made one. And they also categorize them differently. So, um, for example, they don't consider Daniel to be a prophet. They consider him to be a writing. I don't know why, but... They don't, he's not one of the, that. And so they have a very different way of classifying their stuff. Now they still believe and celebrate things like Hanukkah, which is what the two books of Maccabees talk about because they're not found anywhere else. Um, but they don't consider them scripture as of yet. And the main reason was, was because they were ones used by Christians. They were in Greek and the community was trying to quote unquote purify itself again after having such a devastating loss of basically its entire religion. No priesthood, no sacrifice, no temple. That's, it's only at that point that Jews become people of the quote book that we think of as just study Torah and know all the Torah. That wasn't how people lived in Jesus' time except for maybe the scribes. You know, for the average Jew, like the average Catholic, your spiritual life is based on the weekly mass, the big festivals, the rules of the church on fasting. That's how the average Jew lived in Jesus' time, not most of them couldn't even read the Torah if they wanted to. They wouldn't know. It's going to be instructed. So all these things kind of add to the break. The other funny thing, and then I've talked too long, <laughs> is unlike us, the Christian scriptures are closed. In mm -hmm. other words, even if tomorrow we found one of Paul's missing letters, because he refers to letters we don't have, it would not be scripture. Really? Because the understanding is at the time the scripture closed, anything God wanted for revelation was there. And if there's a reason those letters were lost, it's because they weren't important for what God wanted. Mm -hmm. Judaism has an open canon. That means, although it's unlikely, it is possible that Judaism can add other books to their Bible at any time they want. Um, unfortunately, again, Judaism is, is as divided as Protestant groups, so there's no one Jewish authority that the other ones would accept uh, to this day. So that's unlikely of ever happening, but at least it's the possibility. They believe that you could continue to add uh, things to their scriptures. But they use so much of the Talmud, which is the, quote, written oral law, the oral law now written down, that that really is the focus of much of Jewish life. So, okay, let's take our I break. I have one question. Uh, are there actually three different versions of the Bible, the Jewish, and then the Protestant, because it's just been denied, they took books out. Right. But is uh, the Protestant the, the books of the books Jewish? of the of the Jew, the Protestant Old Testament and the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, are the same books. Okay. They're just um, divided up differently, but they're the same books. So they don't have those six or seven. No. 
Um, but there are multiple Bibles there, even today within the church. You have the Protestant version, you have the Catholic version. Yeah. You've got the Eastern Orthodox version that has three more books than we do. Yeah. And you've got the Oriental Orthodox who have about seven or eight more books than we do. So there are different mm -hmm. canons that are accepted as scripture today by Protestant or by different Christian groups. So, okay. yeah. Are there, are there only dividing by, you know, the way you want to divide them rather than substantially the, the content is different? Well, in the case of those other Christians, Orthodox Christians, they're entirely mm -hmm. extra books. Mm -hmm. So the two books of Enoch, for example, are scripture in the Orthodox Church, but have never been so in the Western Church. Um, and it gets even more complicated because not all Orthodox accept the, so it's, uh, generally speaking though, because Catholics make up the vast majority of Christians in the world with over 1.2 billion, um, our, our one is pretty much the oldest one that you can point to, and then at certain points, people either took books out like the Protestants or even earlier than them as the separation between East and West became more divided you'd find that they would um, add these additional some of them would add additional books uh, the difficulty is when people hear Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox they tend to think of them as like uh, Catholics without a Pope and that's not true each church is 100 percent its own and separate <laughs> So the Greeks don't always agree with the Russians, don't always agree with the Syriacs. So each one is its own church, and they don't agree with each other all the time. So some have the exact same books as Catholics, some have extra books. So it's it's really kind of a mess in the Orthodox world, to be honest. So they've never been able to achieve what Catholicism did in being truly Catholic. That is, even today, if you go to any Orthodox church. <laughs> You're going to sit down, and whatever that, wherever that Orthodox Church is from, you know, Russia or Greece, wherever, everybody in there is going to look the same except one or two people, right? They're all going to be same ethnicity, same culture, even in this country, right? Like you, you go to uh, St. Um, Holy Angels, which is a Byzantine Catholic church. I used to go there because I really liked it. I was the only non-dark-skinned Easterner there. I mean, literally, you know, so it, they're still even they've, 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 they've maintained it. They've still maintained a very ethnic thing, which is good in one sense. But they're, they're not known for being super open, despite the, you know, to people beyond their own culture. Whereas Roman Catholicism is pretty much just filled, you know, everything. So in that sense, we've been more successful to carry out the mission. But and they're still sect, very. And certain sects are closed, too. Right. You can't, yeah. you can't even become one of them unless you're. Born, born one, yeah. It's and and because their groups are small, they're very. They know everybody, so like, for I start a whole class on ecumenism for the fifth year, the final year deacons. We start that class on Wednesday here, because they have to have it before they can be ordained. So we talk. I have to talk to them all about ecumenism and dealing with the other churches, Protestant, Orthodox, etc. And it, it's funny because. It, everything doesn't line up. So for example, right after Vatican II, you may or may not know one of the first big events that happened is Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras of the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople, they revoked the, um, the excommunications that had been on each other since the 1100s. Those were revoked. So you would think that means in practice we're, we're cool with each other. Well, from the Catholic side, we are. Any Orthodox person can receive communion or any other sacrament from us. They just come up and do it. You don't have to say anything. But for the Orthodox, even though from the Catholic teaching, you or I could receive mm -hmm. communion at any Orthodox church, most of them won't allow you to. So it's this weird kind of, what did the excommunication actually mean in the end? But they know, because usually the, com the communities are small. <laughs> so if you try to come up, they'll deny you, right? They'll ask, are you Catholic? Are you Orthodox, you know? Because as you come up, what they do is, um, it, they're a little different, each one, but generally there's a deacon there. 
and the priest is on a, is at least a step higher than you, generally speaking. I mean, different churches have different ideas, but generally they're a step above you. And you come up, and you stand like this, like we do if you're not going to receive communion, but you have your head back, straight back up. And generally, it takes place right in the onion dome, and it's always the exact same image. And it's Christ in judgment, Pen Panto Creator, where he's the big Jesus looking down on you. So you look up at him. And the deacon and the helper on the other side are the two deacons, depending on what they have. They, as each person comes up, they put a, a cloth under your face because the wine and the, the bread are already mixed. And so they take it on a spoon. And as you come up, if you're a male, they say, the servant of the Lord, your name, receive the receive the, so, the gift of life. So if you're a female, they say, the handmaiden of the Lord. So they know everybody. So as you come up, that's what they do. And um, so it's very it, it's it's very different than what we do in, in a sense. I mean, it's the same thing. It's still body and blood, all that. But the way that they their tradition does it is very different. They have a whole half-hour thing that people can go to before their liturgy starts. It would be like arriving at Mass half an hour early to watch the priest get everything ready. Because what he has to do is, um, the, it looks like a little tabernacle. The tabernacle is perfectly square in the Bible. And we're going to see heaven is described as perfectly square. So you have this perfect square. Um, and then he has a piece, a loaf of bread that's square that fits exactly in there. And so he puts the loaf of bread in there. And then he has this thing, it looks like a potato masher. You know how that has all the holes? But there's little tiny squares. And, he, and it goes, they're all matched exactly the same size. He puts it and he presses that down. So that one loaf has now become tons of tiny little squares. And then he'll pour the wine in there for them to all sit and soak in for a good half hour before the liturgy before even begins, right, before it's consecrated. Um, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful imagery they still have that's, that's different. You know, when he, when he blesses it, he, uh, he and the deacons take the, the cloth and they wave it over it as the image of the spirit coming down on it. And then the other thing that I think that I always thought was really impressive, which I think we should do too, and that is right before you take communion, there's a prayer everyone has to say together. And it's like a three-paragraph prayer. And in that prayer, it basically tells you that you believe in the real presence. And it makes it really clear if you don't, you shouldn't take communion. Because it has lines like, do not let me become like Judas and betray you and walk out at the last minute. Do not let me, like, it's all this stuff. And then right before communion starts, the last thing the priest says when he holds it up is he says, approach with fear of God and with faith. So they really hammer the real presence, like for every moment of that. Um, so you know definitively that you're coming up and doing things like that. So um, yeah, so I mean, they're really, they're really nice uh, services. And like I said, there's almost every Orthodox communion has a corresponding Catholic one, right? So the Byzantine Catholics are the equivalent of the Greek Orthodox uh, churches. The only one is the Catholic ones are in communion with Rome, and so you can go to communion there and anything else. Um, and so a lot of them are in, a lot of the Eastern one, the Middle Eastern ones are in El Cajon for some reason. I don't know why. It's like three or four different, yeah, the Chaldeans, the Syriacs are there. There's like three or four that are down there. I don't know what it is about El Cajon that's the new Middle East, but they got a lot of churches there, and they're beautiful churches and just very interesting looking. Then we've got the Byzantine Holy Angels is over on Galahad Street, which is kind of above, well, <coughs> now it's Snapdragon, but it's over by Friars. It's just in a neighborhood. If you don't, you wouldn't know how to get there unless you look it up, but it's, it's a nice, it, that's a Byzantine Catholic one. Uh, so you're allowed to go there for communion. So it, it's, it's just kind of neat to kind of see how it's, each one has their own slight difference. It's obviously, as you follow through, you're going to see it's the same pattern as the mass. There's just little slight things they do that are different. You know, um, there's just a lot more symbolism and stuff than we have in in the West, generally speaking. You know, they have the iconostasis, which is the gold thing that represents the the, the barrier between heaven and earth. 
And so what he'll do is he goes out one side when the gospel is being proclaimed, reads it, because the gospel is coming down out of heaven, and then he has to go in through the other door when he's done reading it. And then they do the same thing with the, with the, with the consecrated wine and bread. They come out. Um, and it's always angels on the iconostasis, the ones who guard the way to paradise. And so it, there's just a lot of uh, this. The symbolism is very interesting. And everything's chanted. Everything. You say, Lord, have mercy, like a thousand times, right? The congregation is constantly re responding to what the priest says. So um, it's a very different just way that it's, it's done than ours. But if you were to, like, put it side by side and just look at it, you're going to see it's the, it's the mass. Just each one has their own little way of doing each particular Thing. So, so do they get their priests from the old country? A lot of them do. Not all of them are, but a lot of them are. The, um, the Chaldeans, in fact, when John Paul the Great still had their big theology program up until a few years ago, that was also their seminary. And a lot of those guys were either first generations born uh -huh. here or for, from the old country. Um, yeah. My friend uh, Justin, who's one of my Franciscan brothers, he actually makes the hats for, the, uh, for their bishops because they can't get them from Iraq anymore because of issues. So, so who, who are the Yeshidis from the, the northern Iraq? Yeah, the Yeah, the, the, the I'm not saying it right. Um, it's not Ismailis. I'm trying to think of what they're called. I, yeah, there's, I, there's so many groups. That's the problem is the eastern ones kind of have so many subdivisions, but yeah. yeah. What week is this? Uh, for uh, twelfth, twelfth week. So there's about two more. Because the eighth week is what was brought out on the uh, computer this week. Oh really? I thought it was week twelve. Hmm. Well, it was. Uh, it's, it's, it's so they also put up all my stuff on um, ecumenism, so don't get confused by that, because that goes up for the so class has to watch something. This should be number twelve. It should be. It, this one will be 12, but 11 should be up there. So the first 11 should be up there. That's what I want. Yeah. And where's the best place to find it? Um, Dirty Habits Catholic Podcast. Pardon? Dirty Habits Catholic Podcast. Make sure you put it in Catholic or else you get some really weird thing. <laughs> but don't just put it in Google. Go to YouTube and in the YouTube search, not the Google search, in YouTube, put Dirty Catholic. Dirty, Dirty Habits. Dirty Habits Catholic website, and it'll pop up. Um, and at the bottom of that front page, it has Quinn's, email, Quinn's website and the, di and the uh, parish one. And so all of my older talks that didn't make it over to this newest website, they're all on there. And the second you click on them, it takes you to that page. It doesn't take you like the front page of the thing. So if there's any of the old ones you want to look at or to see what I did, they're all on there as well. So. And, and I should go to YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, and make sure it's the YouTube search bar, not the Google one. So, okay. So, this is a. Well, Chris, when you go like to the churches in Bethlehem, they say that they're the oldest uh, continuous Christian church. Yeah. Well. Uh, that that you have to thank them for the the. Development of the, the Roman Catholic Church through the, the, the Bethlehem. Um, yeah, I don't know about that, but <laughs> they're definitely the oldest in, in Israel, the oldest Christian community that's remained Christian. In fact, they're the almost the only one left that is still predominantly Christian. They are the only one left that's predominantly Christian. The, that one of the saddest things has been the exodus of Catholics from. The Holy Land over the last 20 years it's been huge huge um, part of it's been because of all the conflict um, a lot of it unfortunately has been due to the Israelis <laughs> the, uh, so foreign Christians don't have their visas renewed so that they can slowly slowly lessen the number of priests nuns and Christians that are out there from other countries um, and just other things too. So sadly, the Christian presence in the Holy Land is actually very, very small now. Um, about a tenth of what it was just 20 years ago. Oh, is that why? Yeah. 
So when those guys come and they actually sell the Bethlehem wood and all that, it's honest. That's I mean, there's not a lot they can do for money over there to try to keep those communities alive. And, um, and Bethlehem is surrounded by a fenced, gated area. You know, you have to go in and out at checkpoint and everything mm -hmm. else. So it's, um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I know a lot of the, I've known over the years a lot of the Franciscans who are there because the Franciscans hold on to a lot of the Holy Land sites, which goes back to when Islam controlled the area because uh, the Franciscans were the only group that these, the Muslims would accept as being able to broker peace. So that's why the Franciscans hold all those, those sites, or m many of them. But even they have been, like I said, the Israeli government's been um, purposely not renewing visas so that little by little they're being you know, um, weeded out so that the, the Christian presence is being eroded there purposely. And you know, one of my friends just came back, one of the friars, and he was, he said, you know, they, they just make things hard so that life sucks for you. I mean, he came back, he was lucky, I think it was like three or four days before Hamas attacked. But he came back and he was talking to, because he had a little homecoming when he came back, and he was talking about, he works at the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And he says, to this day, the Israeli government will not let them put in sprinklers or anything, or running water. Uh, down through the whole garden. So if you want to bring stuff up for a lot of things, they still have to literally go to wells with buckets in hand to this very day. Right? It's just to make life hell for them. That's literally all it is. It's just to make it bad so eventually they'll leave. So, um, And he talks about that all the time. He says in terms of everyday life, the Israelis are way harder to deal with than the average Muslim there who's not part of these terrorist groups. The Muslims are pretty fine with Christians, but the the Israeli government just doesn't doesn't want it. Um, you know, if you you're not allowed to make what's called aliyah there, which means to go up uh, to Israel. If you're Jew, any Jew can. However, if you're a Jew who's converted to Christianity, you may not. So they won't accept you. Uh, you can't move to Israel permanently and be a citizen. Similarly, if you're a Jew who becomes Christian in the Holy Land, a lot of people don't know this, in Israel, you lose your status as a permanent citizen. And the government can get rid of you if they want. They can deport you, and they do sometimes. So, yeah, the anti-Christian bias is still a, a huge thing in, in Israel. So, unfortunately. It's all the truth. Uh, I don't, uh, not so much the American or uh, that's not at least I haven't heard that that's where it really falls along it's more just the Israelis are really trying I mean they're really just trying to get a state of Israel back in the sense of really Jewish you know they sick each other they, you know and, anyway I could go on and on but it's not important so. okay I think about two because there's after this there's only one handout left and even though it's a big handout, it kind of goes pretty quick because these chapters sort of, a lot of them, they don't have a lot. I mean, they don't have a quote a lot to say. They're kind of simple <laughs> to go over. So 15, 16, 17, and 18 are all included in this handout. I couldn't fit 19. It was just starting to get too big. So, but 15 just describes the seven last plagues. 16 then tells us about them in details. It details each chalice. And then 17 and 18 actually tell us about the destruction of the city in excruciating detail. Mm. Um, but so this is the last part. This is the last of the fourfold, four sevenfold judgments. So remember, if you remember, the book of Revelation is really structured around four sets of seven. There's a lot of other sevens and other sacred numbers, but the, the main four are um, the, the seven letters. That was the beginning. And that kind of served as the warnings to the church of what's coming. Then you had the um, seven seals of the book as each of the seals of that heavenly book was opened up. And that's sort of the beginning of the judgment starting to fall on Israel and upon the church as well. And at that point, it was very minor in the sense that it was one-fourth. Everything's a fourth, as you see. A fourth of this died, a fourth of this. 
Then it moved to the seven trumpets, and that's what we covered last because there's been this long interlude in between. And the seven uh, trumpets now were like a third is destroyed. Wait, no, it's a half and a third, sorry. Now, we finally reach the culmination, the seven chalices. And so, notice something that this is all very liturgical, because we mentioned that a lot, that John sees everything going on in heaven, the connection between the mass on earth, well, the whole liturgy on earth, but especially the mass and what's happening in heaven. But you have, you know, you have basically the first two are the liturgy of the word. A book with seven seals and seven letters, and then the rest has to do with um, liturgy of the Eucharist. Now, we don't use trumpets in our liturgy anymore, really, at least not most of the time. Um, but here we have... That's what had been in the early church and what was going on there. And then the chalices that are filled with blood are the Eucharist. And so that this now is, is a complete or final destruction. So now John's going to outline the last thing. So in chapter 15, I don't know. It's kind of an interesting thing he does here because he hasn't done this in any of the others. He tells us about the seven plagues, but then he doesn't describe them until 16. So it's almost like he has an extra chapter for just to highlight a few things. He says, Then I saw in heaven another sign, great and awe-inspiring, seven angels with the seven last plagues, for through them God's fury is accomplished. Then I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, on the sea of glass were standing those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and the number that signified its name. They were holding God's harps and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And we'll stop there for now. Then they, they give us the sort of the lyrics. And then after that, he's going to have one more vision before he actually sees the chalices. So if you will, you can actually turn to page two of the handout where it says seven last plagues. I give sort of a background of what, a, but we'll start here. Um, he refers to what's happening here as another sign. Remember he saw the sign of the woman, the sign of the dragon. He's seen these various signs. This one he describes as great and awe-inspiring because he's witnessing symbolically the preparation in heaven for the coming wrath of God seven angels with seven last plagues. And so this ministry indicates that the last days of Israel have arrived. That's why it, quote, through them God's fury is accomplished. So everything is nearing now its definitive end. So what we're seeing happening is the end of the old order to make way for the new covenant of Christ the King. Now, Although John doesn't describe it here, it's important that we recognize the new covenant and how it's not like the old covenant of Moses. This actually, the statement here at the bottom of page two, the last paragraph, actually comes from the book of uh, Jeremiah. But here's what he says. He says, in describing the new covenant, it's the only time the word new covenant is found in the whole Old Testament, Jeremiah says, it, well, God through Jeremiah says, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Right? It's not simply a reformulation of the precepts of the Torah, but it's brand new in that ultimately it fulfills the third and final promise and oath that God made to Abraham before Israel even existed. And what was that promise? Quote, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will find blessing in you. So now the new covenant in Jesus involves the union of all humanity, Jew and Gentile, into one family who literally share in God's own spirit. Right? So the new covenant is completely different than the old one. It's not based on the law. It's not based on these things. It's based solely in this union with Christ made power or present by the Holy Spirit. And so it's not, as Jeremiah goes on to say, it's not a master-slave relationship like Sinai ended up having to be because 
right at the moment of the covenant, they broke it with the golden calf. But instead, what it is now is one of a father and his children. And it's brought about by Yahweh, God forgiving their sins and iniquity through Jesus so that they can be united to him. And so even Jeremiah says, quote, everyone from least to greatest shall know me. Right? You, can, you encounter the Lord personally. You don't need the priesthood, the sacrifices, everything, in able to approach the Lord. So he describes this, and then he says, he, he starts by saying, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. So before he starts getting into the woes and all the chalices and what's going to happen, he sees the martyrs standing, a sign of victory, like we always see the lamb is standing. And they're standing on something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. What this is, is it's the pavement that leads into the heavenly sanctuary. It was seen by Moses. It was seen by Ezekiel. It was seen by the various prophets. It was seen by Paul. And it was seen by John. In the temple on earth in Jerusalem, it was represented by what was called the Bronze Sea, this huge bronze washing or bowl, I don't know what you call it, pool. It was held on the back of eight oxen uh, um, statues, and it was used for all the, uh, for purifying themselves before and after they offered sacrifice. The priests would use it to wash their hands, their feet, etc. So you have that. But at the same time, the glass is now red, and it's mingled with fire. And the reason is because fire represents the holiness that's necessary to stand in the presence of God. And these Christians have received that because they have been victorious over their earthly trials. They have, in other words, passed through the, quote, fire of tribulation and trial and persecution. So they're standing like Israel is standing on the opposite shore of the Red Sea in victory over those who have been defeated. And so only those who have been tried and purified can enter the presence of the Lord, baptize the water, and confirmed the fire. So those who have been made initiated into the mysteries, whereas the same divine fire will soon annihilate the sinners who dare to approach God's holiness. And you see this throughout the, the Bible as well. You'll notice any time the Lord appears, and he always appears generally through an angel or through some manifestation. He can't really appear directly to us. We couldn't handle it. But even his glory is, is terrifying to human beings, right? The moment he reveals to Moses who he is, what does Moses do? He's afraid to look at God. When Hannah, um, Hannah? yeah, when Hannah's son almost dies, Ishmael, and the angel comes and speaks to her and tells her where to find the water so he'll be saved. After he leaves, she's shocked. She says, have I really seen God? Which is really just the angel, but she says, have I ever seen God and lived to tell? So there, there's the idea that we cannot, if there's any sin within a person whatsoever, you cannot look upon God. Um, if you've ever seen the images or you've been to Israel at the Wailing Wall, um, and even in synagogue, depending on the type of synagogue, Jews pray like this. Okay, You cannot look at God. That's the imagery that I can't look upon his face. It's just beyond me at this point. Um, and a lot of this comes from also the, later in the book of uh, Exodus, that after the golden calf incident, God is very specific that... Um, Mo, even Moses doesn't have the exact same relationship with him after this. So, example, here's what he says following the golden calf. He says, I will now send an angel before you to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I myself will no longer go up in your company because they've sinned. Because you are a stiff-necked people, otherwise I would exterminate you on the way. When the people heard this news, they mourned and they refused to wear ornaments. The Lord again said to Moses, speak to them and tell them. It's because you're a stiff-necked people. Were I even to go into your company, even for a moment, you would be destroyed. Right? God's holiness can't help it. Sin cannot abide his presence whatsoever. And that's why as we're getting in the last chapters of Revelation, chapters 20, 21, 22, three times it'll tell us who's not in heaven and why. Because nothing can enter heaven that's not perfectly holy. Nothing. 
um, it, it, it's almost like God can't help it. He just annihilates sin in his actual presence. That also helps us understand a little better the whole purpose of purgatory. Right? Mm -hmm. Most of us are not perfectly clean when we leave this world to enter into his presence. And so we need that last final cleansing yeah. to be able to enter into that purification. But anyways, yeah. Just a quick question here. Uh, only those who have been tried and been purified can enter the presence of the Lord. Then we have baptized equals water, confirmed equals fire. So is confirmation a prerequisite? Well, that's what the, uh, John, John is talking about initiation here. And so the fire of confirmation, the, the water of baptism, they show someone that's fully initiated into the life of the church. Now, until almost the 800s, you were confirmed and baptized at the exact mm -hmm. same moment. So it really would have been the same. Um, in, the e in the West, what happened is, as, as the barbarian invasions, the, the whole uh, Roman society collapsed. Um, and it wasn't a collapse because necessarily of wars. We think that like, you know, we think of these hordes of Germans, this wave after wave attacking the Romans. It wasn't like that at all. But imagine literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, whole tribes, are just pouring into your, well, we do know, our southern border, right? Yeah. Literally, are just pouring in and settling wherever. And society starts to break down. The Romans, the roads start to break down. Places get dangerous to travel. That's what really happened. Long before, I mean, the Romans won't be conquered until the year 400, where one of the tribes, the Vandals, finally attacks Rome and defeats it. But the society was collapsing because they couldn't they couldn't handle this influx of all these people and, and everything else and so what happened in the west the point is what happened in the west is because towns became so separated from each other with all these barbarians literally living in the midst of them um, the bishops weren't weren't readily available for confirmation and so in the west and only in the west only for catholics in the west Confirmation and baptism became separate hmm. times. But in the East, they've always been the same to this right. very day. When a kid, they actually get communion too. Yep. When the child is baptized, they're immediately um, anointed right. over their whole body usually. And then a tiny, I told you, it's like a spoon. So it's the wine with this tiny, tiny, tiny piece of bread in the, yep. in the kid's mouth. So you are fully initiated from the beginning. And that's how the whole church used to do it. So when John writes this, it wouldn't have seemed as, as odd to us as it is now because of historical circumstance. In John's time and for the first 800 years of the church, he received the sacraments all at once. So anybody baptized would have been confirmed and vice versa. So, um, uh, so they're victorious because they've conquered the seed of the dragon, right? We're told they had won mm -hmm. the victory over the beast its image, and the number that signified its name. So we're looking at people who have come through the great persecution of the church. Now, it's not clear whether they've died and were killed by Rome or whether they passed through and were faithful but were not killed in some way or maybe a little both. It's not described. It just simply says that all these people are victorious. Then we're told they're holding harps and they sang the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb. And so right at the, we'll come back to that in a moment because we're going to talk a little more about this song of Moses. But right at the end then, um, this leads directly into this, uh, this event that we're going to see that seven angels are given seven chalices filled with the wrath of God. So in the actual song we're given here, there's a few points that are made in the great and wonderful are your works lord god almighty just and true are your ways O king of the nations who will not fear you lord or glorify your name for you alone are holy all the nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed so each of these things um, really are references back both to the old testament story of god but also carrying forward to kind of show the same god present throughout all of history and so for each one, I just gave a little, a little blurb about it you know, on pages four and five. So first he says, great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Um, he specifically is referring to the great and marvelous final judgments, the, the great th you know, things like the Exodus where God um, 
pronounce judgment on, on Egypt while saving Israel, all the different things through history, his great marvelous acts that he's done, his miracles. And now we're going to see another one, another, quote, great and awe-inspiring act, as John called it. Just and true are your ways, right? God is righteous and true, especially in reference to his judgments. He delivers the church. He destroys its enemies. And so even in times of tribulation on earth, when worldly powers appear to be triumphing over the church, and she has often been led to doubt the greatness of God, the justice and truth of his ways, and to doubt whether he's really the king of the heathen, this doubt will now be put to shame, right? All those in those times who were not sure what was going on, what was God's plan, why is he letting these horrible things happen, it'll be dispelled entirely as they see God's action of what's happening. Um, they refer to him as king of the nations, and we're going to see as ruler of the nations, God, Yahweh moves the armies of earth to fulfill his purposes in judgment. So he's going to use Rome, he's going to use whoever he wants to fulfill um, what he needs. And in fact, many of the um, titles that, he's, that God's going to be given in these next few chapters are his titles of war, right? Whenever you see the, the title Lord God of Hosts, Host is an army, so that's literally the Lord of armies. His army on earth was Israel, now it's the church. His army in heaven is the angelic, um, the angelic uh, choirs and such. Who will not fear you, Lord, or glorify your name? In other words, who will not be converted? Even here at the very end, even now at the, literally the 11th hour, God is still appealing to Israel to change its ways and anyone in Israel who will still return to him. In other words, who will not serve him, who will not worship him and obey him. Um, then you alone are holy. God's holiness in scripture often refers not so much to ethical qualities, that's what we tend to think of, but the fact that he's unique, absolute, transcendent, other. Um, as it's often said, there's an infinite gulf that separates us from God. Right? He is infinite. That's what holy, the word holiness, kadosh, means separate. That's what the word actually means. Separate. He's separate. So for people, he separates the holy from the, the ordinary or profane people, it makes them part of his group. He separates um, or, and consecrates objects to his use that if you use for any other reason, lose their status. So, for example, if any priest ever took his chalice home and drank wine out of it just at his table, it could never be used for mass again. Oh. It can't be done. You only can use those things for sacred things. Um, so the holiness of God, and in the end, only God is ultimately holy. Our holiness comes from a participation, a bestowal of his own uh, holiness upon us. And, of course, Jesus is, is the the incarnate holiness of God. That's what we um, pray in the glory, right? You alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You are the Most High, Jesus Christ. What it literally says in Latin, you are the Holy One. Tu sola, tu solus sancti. You are the only saint. That's what the mm -hmm. words actually say in Latin. You, Jesus, are the only saint. Any other saint is a saint simply because you've bestowed your holiness uh, upon them. So Jesus is like the conduit of the holiness of God the Father uh, to earth. Um, and yet there's the irony because he's so transcendent. In a sense, he's unapproachable, right? He's infinitely distant from us. And yet, ironically, in truth, because he's infinite, he's also completely imminent. That is, he's closer to us than we are to ourselves. Mm. He's accessible to wow. everyone. And then finally, the statement, all the nations will come and worship before you for your righteous act has been revealed. Well, the whole point of Jesus' ministry is to bring the nations, the Gentiles, back into the covenant with Israel. So it's both Jew and Gentile. And so here we kind of have a, a, a acclamation of what the whole point of the church is, to gather all the people of all the nations um, to the, to the um, worship of the one true God through his Messiah, the anointed one. Um, what's going on here very interestingly is uh, John is using the idea of the heavenly liturgy and the heavenly liturgy and the earthly Sabbath 
not the church, but the earthly Sabbath worship at John's time uh, is kind of are connected here. Because in the earthly Sabbath in John's time, in the morning uh, Sabbath service, there are two songs of Moses in the Bible, and we're not told which one it is, which means John probably has both in mind. In the morning, you sang the song of Moses that came from the book of Deuteronomy. In the evening, you sing the song of Moses that comes from the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. And so here the church is joining into these two songs, and the songs are very, um, very different. Uh, I don't want to take tons of time on them, but it, it is important to kind of get a little bit of an idea of them. <laughs> so the first one, let's look at them real briefly. If, if you have your Bible, the first one is Exodus chapter 15. This is the first song of Moses. And as, you, as we look at it, it's important to kind of figure out what you think, how this ties into, you know, what John is telling us now in Revelation. So it's the first, uh, really the first 21 verses oh, yeah. of, of um, Exodus 15. And it occurs right after the Red Sea when the, the uh, Pharaoh's armies have been destroyed. Right, so then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. So this is Moses' first song. And if you go to the Easter Vigil, we always sing this hymn, right? Because it's connected to baptism with the water and the destruction of evil and the new life coming forth. Uh, it's, it's sung in, in a psalm version. Hmm. He says, I'll sing to the Lord for his gloriously triumphant horse and charities cast to the sea. My strength and my refuge is, is the Lord. He has become my Savior. This is my God. I praise him, the God of my Father. I extol him. The Lord is a warrior. Lord is his name. And then, you know, he, he talks about all the things that has, has happened, and God has been victorious over his adversaries, um, all the power he shows when he uh, frees Israel from the power of this. You know, who is like you among the lords, the gods, O Lord? Verse 11 who is like you, magnificent among the holy ones, awe-inspiring, etc. So it's a song of victory. It's a song of, of God coming and saving his people. Uh, and notice, you know, they're standing on a, quote, sea of glass in the imagery in heaven. And here we, they're singing a song of Moses, which has to do with the destruction of, of uh, Egypt at the last sea, the power of, of God to save his people. So for this one, the first psalm, Song of Moses, is a very good one. It's one of victory and joy, and you can see where that fits in. The church is now victorious over um, evil. The second one is very different. It's, it's the, near the very end of Deuteronomy. It's chapter 32, so literally almost the very end. And uh, it actually starts with the last oh, verse yeah. of chapter 31, but... It says the song of Moses. Moses recited the words of this song in their entirety for the whole assembly of Israel to hear. Now, this one is very different. In this one, he calls Israel and reminds them who God is, how powerful he is. And yet, very early, it, it takes a quick turn that Israel is not living up to its, its status. Right, verse 5, yet his degenerate children have treated him basely, a twisted and crooked generation. Is this how you repay the Lord, so foolish and unwise a people? Is he not your father who begot you, the one who made and established you? Then he kind of goes through Israel's history and how God has saved them, how he's done all these different things. And then once we get to like verse 15, we see again how he's kind of changing. Jacob ate and was satisfied. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You became fat, gross, and gorged. You forsook the God who made you and scorned the rock of your salvation. With strange gods, they incited him and abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, to no gods, to gods they had never known. So we, we keep seeing that Israel has this. The first one was all about victory. This one starts off good about all the things God has done for them, but it ends by telling us how horrible Israel has responded. And so the other reason why John doesn't distinguish, he just says the song of Moses, is because he means for both to exist side by side. For the church, Exodus 15, the song of Moses, is going to be their victory. 
for ethnic Israel, it's going to be Deuteronomy 32, Moses' view, that it's going to, everything's going to fall apart. And so in verse 22, he says, For my wrath of fire is kindled that has raged the depths of Sheol, and it will consume the land with its yield, set on fire the foundation of the mountains. And he talks, at, he talks how Israel's going to be um, punished and all the, the failures they've lived in these things. And in, in fact, it ends with, with God making a promise, as surely as I live forever, verse 40. I will sharpen my flashing sword, lay hold of my judgment. With vengeance, I will repay my foes and requite those who hate me. And it ends by his taking vengeance on his foes. So it's, it's very interesting because, ironically now, God's foe is his own people. But he had warned them, literally from the very beginning of the covenant, the book of Deuteronomy, that this is what will happen if you fall away. So both these images are invoked by the idea of God's, um, of God's wrath and his salvation. And then the very last thing John sees is he has another vision where he says, the temple in the heavenly tent of testimony opened. Seven angels with seven plagues came out of the temple, dressed in clean white linen with gold sash around their chest. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven gold bowls, this translation says bowls, it's the chalices, it's the ones, the cups used for liquid sacrifices, libations. Filled with the fury of God who lives forever and ever, the temple became so filled with smoke from God's glory and might that no one could enter it until the seven plagues of the angels had been accomplished. So what we see is in heaven, the tent of testimony would be the inner, inner space of the tabernacle. So they emerge from the holiest place, the holy of holies in heaven, so to speak. And um, they're dressed as priests, these seven angels, showing their purity, their righteousness, and also connecting them to Jesus, who's seen earlier in Revelation dressed the same way. They have these bowls, the bowls you would pour out the, the wine and the other liquid sacrifices. Um, and they are now about to apply these seven curses that were first announced by the seven trumpets. The fact that they're angels and the fact that they receive the bowls or the chalices from one of the four living creatures in the throne room of God all point to the fact inescapably it is God and God alone who is responsible for what's about to fall on Israel, right? They can't blame human beings. They can't blame fate or chance. It all is coming from God. And so they're entrusted with these sacramental sanctions to pour out the, quote, blood of the covenant. And so then we're told the temple becomes so filled with smoke from his glory, no one can enter it. Now, that same thing happened multiple times in history. The tabernacle was so filled with, with um, the glory cloud of God that no one could enter it till he left. The temple was filled with it. You see, it, it's this image more and more powerful. So what happens is what he's talking about. And notice, no one can enter until the plagues have been accomplished. In order for the church to take full possession of its divine inheritance and assume its place as the new covenant, the old covenant has to be destroyed. Right? There can't be two. Hence, no one can enter heaven, quote unquote, until it's all accomplished. The new covenant cannot fully be who it's meant to be while the old temple remains in place. And so that's what, what uh, John is signifying here is that now the fullness and perfection of the church is finally able to enter into the world because no one was able to get into heaven while the old temple stood in place. And now that both exist side by side, one has to go so that the Old T Testament passes away the old order to make way for the new. And so that's basically chapter 15, very quick. Like I said, I don't know why he has this huge buildup at this one point finally, and now in chapter 16, he's gonna tell us each of the seven you know, chalices, and as they're poured out, what happens specifically, and then in 17, 18, expand that even further to this great description of what fall the fall of Babylon slash Jerusalem. Okay, so that's 
this is bringing us to literally sort of the very end of the historical story. When we finish this handout, the last handout will be really on, on the true last days. Uh, chapters 20, 21, coming. and 22 really talk about the last judgment, not the judgment of Israel, the last judgment, the new heaven and earth, all that stuff. So uh, it, the last few chapters of John's book actually are literally and primarily about the end of the world, the judgment of the nations, etc. Um, and so this will be the last, quote, historical one that talks about um, the fall of Israel. But like I said last week, the, remember the pattern is always going to be Jew then Gentile. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the Jews in general, not every specific detail, but in general the pattern is going to be what we see again at the end of the world for the nations and the church. It's going to follow the same basic pattern. So, okay. Which is why Jesus warns the church a lot, right? It seems like it's going to be like Israel, sadly. We think we wouldn't, but it is. He has those sad statements where he says things like, when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith on earth? Right? And, and the apostasy of much of the church in the end. Uh, John's the one who tells us the ones leading the Antichrist are people who were Christian. They're not pagans. They were all came from us, John said. They weren't really of us, or they would have stayed, but they came out of us. So... Uh, sort of the story of the church, in a sense, is repetitive of Israel to an extent, what's going to happen. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and, and end in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together and to just understand more and more of the mystery of your plan throughout the ages. We thank you, Lord, for the great blessing of the Messiah you have sent. Not only did you create us, but you sent your Son to redeem us, and you continually send your Spirit to sanctify us. Also that we who were created in love will be sustained in love through our life here and are destined for eternal love in the next life. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to draw more and more people into that relationship, into your church, we ask that we ourselves will be models of the gospel and of Jesus Christ to draw others to us. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless our country, bless our church, bless the universal church as it goes through this synod and discusses various issues. We also uh, just ask your blessings on Israel and the attacks that have come upon our brothers in faith, the other, the first covenant. And we just ask, Lord, that you who are the Prince of Peace will just place your hand on all these situations and bring about your kingdom quickly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, you guys.